I'm really, I'm really glad and surprised to be the moderator of uh, the speech of Karen. So Karen Koch studied philosophy in Berlin and Paris. From 2016 to 2022, she was a researcher and teaching fellow associated with the chair of the history of philosophy at the Department of Philosophy at the Freie University in Berlin. She received her PhD last year at the Freie Universität Berlin with a thesis entitled Thinking in Purposes, the meaning and status of theology in Kant's and Hegel's theoretical philosophy. Her thesis will be published next year in the Hegel Student Beheizen, in Kornmein and Verlag. After a research stay at the University of Padua, she currently is a Fritz Thyssen Fellow at the Freie Universität Berlin, working on a project on the relation between mechanism and inner purposivenesses in Hegel's philosophy of nature. Her next project will be on the question of situated knowledge and the a priori in classical German philosophy, in particular in Schelling and in Kant. She's published several articles and blog posts of which I would like to mention two here. Purposiveness is nature, Hegel and Spinoza on anthropomorphism and backward causation, which appeared in 2021 in Intellectual History Review, and then mechanism, external purposiveness, and object individuation, from mechanism to theology in Hegel's Science of Logic, which is forthcoming in the Hegel Bulletin. So now I let you the floor, thank you. and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to thank uh, the organizers. <laughs> maybe I just know how you can do it. Anyway, thanks to the organizers <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to, to give a talk here. And um, um, I think this is a great conference, but I will tell the organizers later on <laughs> what I think. Um, and um, as it should be clear from the um, short bio, this is the um, talk I'm going to give is related to a new project, which is on a priori. Actually, like Kant is the background of this project, but it's mostly based on Schelling and Hegel. Um, it's really um, a new project, so um, any comments, critiques, hints are really very, very welcome. Um, and the talk will be in English, but you can um, raise questions in um, English, German, and French. Um, I'm sorry, my Spanish is uh, not that good, so I won't understand, I guess. Um, but yeah, all the, other, um, all the other three languages are fine. And then, um, without further ado, I'll just start. And I'm going to read it, but I have a PowerPoint, so I hope you can follow easily. Let's see. <coughs> Hegel's logic is usually taken to be a project that uncovers the a priori concepts that struct structure reality. In his latest book, Robert Pippin, for instance, states, quote, that the logic is a work of a priori philosophy is hardly controversial, end of quote. Along the lines of this common reading, Hegel's logic is supposed to contain the most fundamental truths of reality that are, val that are valid ahistorically, i.e. once and for all. Hegel's real philosophy, or real philosophy, in turn, is supposed to be understood as an application of the conceptual structures that are developed in the logic. It is striking, however, that Hegel almost never uses the a priori, a posteriori terminology, and with respect to the rare passages um, in which he refers to this terminology, he does so in a dismissing way. In his logic, for instance, he promises that he will offer a discussion of thought determinations that, beginning of quote, considers them, the thought determinations, not according to the abstract forms of the a priori as contrasted with the a posteriori, end of quote. And in his real philosophy, he refers to this terminology as enabling certain philosophers or scientists to presuppose arbitrary thoughts about the world that then serve as guiding principles for philosophy, philosophical inquiry. With respect to this procedure, Hegel states that, beginning of quote, it can only deserve blame to presuppose arbitrary ideas or thoughts and to want to find and imagine real events and deeds appropriate to them, end of quote. And he claims that this uh, procedure to be an a priori procedure. Hegel adopts this dismissive attitude towards the a priori in the philosophy of spirit as well as in the philosophy of nature. In my talk, 
I am concerned with the systematic reasons underlying Hegel's dismissive attitude towards the a priori. That is, I am concerned with the systematic reasons that speak against a reading of Hegel's logic in a priori terms. I will put forward two theses. Next slide. Um, the negative claim, claim one, um, I will defend is that Hegel refuses such a terminology because of its subjective origin and because of its ahistorical implications. The second positive claim I will hold is that there are strong reasons why for Hegel philosophical knowledge is always situated. And I will call such a knowledge situated whose validity, validity is not independent from experience. To flesh out the second thesis, I will draw on the concept that Hegel takes to be the defining feature of philosophical practice, thinking over. And um, I shall announce, or I would like to announce, um, or I'd like to say now, that the second thesis, um, um, where I will draw on, the, um, on thinking over, or nachdenken in Hegel, um, there I only announce or point to, to um, to this positive claim, but I can't elaborate on this claim in total because it rests um, on a theoretical conception of gaining knowledge um, that I would have to elaborate on. But yeah, so it's just like a point and a hint to something I would have to do next then. Um, there I'm really interested in your comments. Um, to be clear, I think that such a discussion of Hegel's use or dismissal, dismissal of the a priori terminology is not only of exegetical historical relevance. It is not only a discussion about the right terminology. For, as I have already implied, a priori readings of the logic dismiss any significance of the historical context and historical situatedness of philosophizing subjects for the validity of the concept of the logic. I will, however, provide, or I hope to do so at least, plausible arguments speaking for a reading of Hegel according to which Hegel takes the historical situatedness of philosophizing subjects into account, even in his logic. That might be controversial, but we'll see later on. Consequently, I will provide arguments speaking for a reading of the logic according to which the logic itself represents situated knowledge. Along these lines, I understand the notion that I put in the title of my talk, Historical Objectivity, to refer to a reading of the logic that takes the concepts of the logic to be situated. I think that this makes Hegel interesting for contemporary feminist calls for considering the historical and social situatedness of philosophizing subjects for philosophical theory. In my talk, I will proceed as follows. First, I will briefly discuss the meaning of the notion of a priori that is relevant in Kant, in which I think is at stake in Hegel's remarks on the a priori. In the second part of my talk, I will draw on a comment by Hegel on Kant's metaphysical deduction of the categories. I will argue that Hegel complains that Kant did not succeed in, the, in deriving the categories, but that against um, what one might think first, Hegel's complaint does not imply um, that he thinks we actually need an a priori derivation of the categories. And in the third and last part of my talk, I provide reasons why we should understand Hegel's derivation of concept determinations, um, why we should not, that's important, why we should not understand Hegel's derivation of concept determinations in an a priori manner. So I start with the first part of my talk, Kant and Hegel on the a priori. One of the most prominent definitions of the a priori in the critique of pure reason is to call such a cognition a priori that is independent of all experience. Kant contrasts this kind of cognition with cognition a posteriori, um, that is cognition, as Kant calls it, that is merely borrowed from experience, and as such not independent from experience. Let us unpack these definitions a little bit. In characterizing a priori cognition as cognition independent of experience, Kant does not refer to cognition that could somehow be gained by subjects before they actually enter the realm of experience, as opposed to cognition that could be gained only within the realm of experience. 
In contrast, subjects gain each kind of cognition, a priori and a posteriori cognition, within the realm of experience. A priori cognition does not even imply in Kant that we do not need experience at all in order to gain such a cognition. In fact, Kant stresses the importance of experience for both kinds of cognition. And that's the first longest quote. Kant says, there is no doubt, whatever, that all our cognition begins with experience. For how else should the cognitive faculty be awake into exercise if not through objects that stimulate our senses and in part themselves produce representations. In part bring the activity of our understanding into motion to compare these, to connect or separate them, and thus to work up the raw material of sensible impressions into a cognition of objects that is called experience. As far as time is concerned then, no cognition in us precedes experience. And with experience, every cognition begins." End of quote. Only experience sets our cognitive activity capacities in motion, which is necess a necessary condition for gaining cognition, whatever kind of cognition it is. That's how I understand this quote. In this sense, experience is a necessary condition also for a priori cognition. The distinction between a priori and a posteriori cognition rather concerns the role of intuition, wahrnehmung, and being part of experience, but not part of our conceptual faculty in justifying the very cognition. Whereas a posteriori cognition is verified or falsified by intuition, a priori cognition cannot be verified or falsified by intuition. It is helpful to put this distinction in terms of the genesis, genesis validity distinction. While we do not need experience in order to gain cognition at all, that is for the genesis of cognition, a priori cognition is valid independent of experience. Thus, according to this distinction, Kant differentiates cognition that is valid independent of experience and hence non-falsifiable from empirically contingent falsifiable cognition. According to Kant, philosophical cognition is a priori cognition par excellence. This a priori terminology has two implications. The first is that concepts that are a priori are of subjective origin in Kant, so I'm talking about Kant still. Um, and the second is that concepts that are a priori are ahistorical. Let's draw on the first teacher first, that is the subjective origin of a priori concepts. According to Kant, a priori concepts are concepts that are given only in the understanding of a rational subject. That is, these concepts are not somehow taken from the realm of experience. It is helpful to contrast a priori concepts with a posteriori concepts in order to unpack what is meant by a priori concepts not being taken from experience. In contrast to the concept of a dog, for example, where, quote Kant, we always have experience at hand, end of quote, because the content of the concept of a dog refers to the intuition of an empirical entity we call a dog, a priori concept, the categories do not refer to specific empirical entities since their content is not drawn from the realm of experience. As such, Kant says, pure concepts, and let's see, um, quote, as such, Kant says, pure concepts of the understanding in comparison with the empirical, indeed general sensible intuitions, are entirely inhomogeneous and can never be encountered in an intuition, end of quote. And it is in the so-called metaphysical deduction of the first critique that Kant tries to show the a priori origin of the categories in arguing that a priori concepts can be deduced from the form of judgments originating in the eye. To sum up, according to Kant, experience sets our mind in motion. Experience is in this sense necessary for the subject becoming aware of the categories, but experience does not contain anything of the sort of the categories. In this sense, the categories are subjective. They have a purely subjective origin. And now I go, um, I turn to the 
second feature of a priori concepts, that's a feature I called um, the ahistoricity. Against this background, it is easy to see in which sense the a priori concepts imply an ahistoricity in Kant. A priori concepts represent something that is given independent of experience, and as such, these concepts do not change or alter as a result of experience. It is rather the clue of Kantian philosophy to establish a priori categories on the grounds of which it is possible to gain cognition irrefutable in light of experience. In the following, I will call the inalterability and the irrefutability of a priori concepts and of a priori cognition, respectively, they are their a historicity. Consequently, a priori concepts and a priori cognition, respectively, are not situated concepts or cognition in the sense that for the validity of such a priori cognition, the empirical context is not important. I think it is pretty clear that Hegel understands the term of a priori in the Kantian sense. Like I refer to the passages now where Hegel really uses the a priori. In his reconstruction, or in Hegel's reconstruction of Kantian critical philosophy, for instance, Hegel states that an element of the Kantian analysis of experience that does not, that's the um, quote, that does not stem from the empirical as such belongs to the spontaneity of thinking or is a priori, end of quote. quote. I think we are safe to say that Hegel means by an element that does not stem from the empirical as such um, and that he calls a priori such an element of the Kantian theory that is neither verified nor falsified through experience. The rare passages in which Hegel uses the notion of a priori himself confirm this understanding. In his philosophy of nature, for instance, Hegel argues against the truths of the actually wrong um, physical hypothesis of an imperceptible imperceptible material heat, Wärmestoff. Back then, physicists claimed that there exists a material heat that is independent from other materials, and they claimed that this material heat is not perceptible. Hegel complains here that the assumption of this material heat being imperceptible serves to, first quote, make the physicist's claim of the independence of heat as a matter empirically irrefutable, end of quote. He points out that as a consequence, the experience of the actual vanishing of heat is explained by physicists as a mere concealment or fixation in a state of imperceptibility, and that the experience of the actual occurrence of heat at places where heat was not formally present is explained as an emergence from mere imperceptibility. Hegel thus concludes that, this is the second quote, it is in this way that the metaphysics of independence is set up against, exper against the experience mentioned, and there Hegel means the vanishing or appearance of heat, and presupposed a priori. In this quote, Hegel connects the a priori terminology with the claim of an assumption being empirically irrefutable. He thus understands a priori claims as claims that can neither be verified or falsified by experience. Now, turning to the second part of my talk, I will draw on a comment of Hegel on Kant's metaphysical deduction of the categories, that is, um, on his Hegel's comment of Kant's a priori deduction of the categories, and my aim here is twofold in the second part of the talk. My first goal is to show that a reading of the quote of Hegel's stance towards Kant's metaphysical deduction of the categories that might be obvious against the Kantian background is not the only possible and plausible reading of this comment. And second, I aim to suggest another reading of Hegel's stance towards Kant's metaphysical deduction that does not consider the a priori at all. Because as I will show, or as I, um, as I think the comment can be understood in a way that one might think that Kant um, does not succeed in derivating the, um, 
in categories a priori, but that Hegel thinks one has to do so. And I will argue, no, it does not follow from Hegel's comment on Kant's metaphysical deduction that we have to do so in an a priori manner. And the comment um, I will draw on is found in the encyclopedia um, in Hegel's comments on Kant's critical philosophy. It's quite a long comment, sorry about that, but um, yeah, I hope it's, yeah, it's readable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Hegel claims, we are all well aware that Kant's philosophy took the easy way in, in its finding of the categories. I, the unity of self-consciousness, is totally abstract and completely undetermined. So how are we to arrive at the determinations of the I or the categories? Fortunately, we can find the various kinds of judgment already specified empirically in the traditional logic. <coughs> to judge, however, is to think a determinate object. So the various modes of judgment that have already been enumerated give us the various determinations of thinking. It remains a profound and enduring merit of Fichte's philosophy to have reminded us that the thought determinations must be exhibited in their necessity and that it is essential for them to be deduced. Fichte's philosophy ought to have had at least this effect upon the method of presenting a treatise on logic that the thought determinations in general or the usual logical material, the species of concepts, judgments, and syllogisms are no longer just taken from observation and thus apprehended only empirically, but are deduced from thinking itself." End of quote. Now, with respect to this comment, and against a, a, a Kantian background, it seems obvious to hold that this comment shows that Hegel thinks, as I said, we need an a priori deduction of the categories. According to this reading, what I think is at least in the first, in the first place um, pretty obvious, Hegel claims that Kant has not succeeded to derive the categories a priori. To derive the categories a priori, however, is also, according to Hegel, a task that needs to be accomplished. In contrast to this reading, I think that another plausible reading of this quote is that Hegel's main critique of Kant is not that Kant has failed in deriving the categories a priori. His main critique is that Kant has not succeeded in deriving the categories at all. So I make a difference between deriving the categories a priori and deriving the categories at all. And I think what Hegel is claiming here is that Kant um, has not succeeded in deriving the categories at all. And I will arrive it now um, on how I mean that and how I think and um, one could read this quote in such a way. I assume that the quote consists of two parts, which I'm not supposed to say that, um, each part making one specific point. I think that the reference to Fichte in the middle kind of, of the quote um, is indicating the second part of the quote. And I will focus on the first part for now. As I mentioned, the task of the metaphysical deduction in Kant is to show the a priori origin of the categories. For this reason, Kant aims to derive the table of the categories from the table of judgments and claims that the kind of judgments originate in the eye. In the quote, Hegel argues that Kant did in fact not deduce the kind of judgments from the eye, but that he found the kinds of judgments from which the categories are deduced in an empirical way that is, by looking into books of traditional logic. With respect to the distinction between genesis and validity I drew on um, in the first part of my talk, and with respect to defend Kant, one could now argue that picking up the kinds of judgments from books of traditional logic is an entirely coherent procedure within Kantian philosophy, as long as Kant shows that their validity is shown independently from these textbooks. And that is as long as Kant succeeds in showing the a priori origin. According to Hegel, this is, however, exactly what Kant fails to do. Hegel claims that it's not clear how the judgments are derived from the eye. This is indicated, I think, in the first sentence of the quote. Hegel therefore states, contrary to the Kantian claim, 
the categories do not rest up on an a priori foundation and states as, oh sorry, Hegel therefore states that, I forgot the that, contrary to the Kantian claim, the categories in Kant do not rest on an a priori foundation and Hegel states elsewhere that they rest up on, the psych on, a, up on a psychological historical foundations. I will not pick up the theme of the psychological foundation right here, but what Hegel means by the historical foundation is exactly the picking up of the categories from the books of traditional logic. Um, I also don't want to discuss the question whether Hegel is wrong or right in this critique. Um, what I want to point out here is that in the first part of the quote, just to the, um, yeah, just to the Fichtian reference, I think that Hegel doubts um, the a priori status of the kinds of judgment and therefore of the categories, but Hegel does not claim in the first part, to Fichte, um, but Hegel does not claim that categories actually need an a priori status. It's not just not written there. Um, in what I take to be the first part of the quote, he only objects that Kant's claim of the a priori status of the kind of judgments, and therefore of the categories, is actually inconsistent with Kant's very procedure of gaining the kinds of judgment and the categories respectively. Now, a possible rejoinder to this, to my reading now, could be that the affirmative reference to Fichte in the second part of the quote, or what I take to be the second part there, um, implies that Hegel is of the opinion that the kinds of judgments and the categories respectively, uh, yeah, respectively do need an a priori status. In response to that, note that Hegel, that in the quote Hegel does not use the term a priori. He does not claim that the categories need an a priori status. What he does claim instead is that the categories need to be deduced. That is what I take to be the second point of Hegel's criticism of Kant. Kant was not able to deduce the categories. Now the guiding question for the, sec for the second part here of my talk is, what does e Hegel actually mean by deduce? No, that's right. <coughs> it seems to be clear to me that Hegel refers to this notion in only one specific Kantian sense. I first discuss the Kantian meaning of the term and then show what, what meaning of deduce Hegel draws upon. In the critique of pure reason, Kant presents two deductions of the categories. The first one is the metaphysical deduction, as already mentioned, and the second one is the transcendental deduction of the categories. Whereas the metaphysical deduction is supposed not only to show the subjective origin of the categories, but also their completeness, the transcendental deduction is supposed to show that we are justified in applying the categories to appearances. I deal with the meaning of the second deduction, the transcendental deduction first, since I think with respect to Hegel's project, we can leave this meaning of deduction aside quite easily. With respect to the transcendental deduction, Kant refers to the juridical meaning of the notion deduction. A deduction is supposed to establish the entitlement or claim um, or legal claim of something. Against the Kantian background, a deduction is supposed to establish the entitlement of implying the categories to the realm of appearances. This establishment is Kant's goal in the transcendental deduction. The transcendental deduction shall prove that the a priori concepts, the categories, really obtain to the realm of appearances and that we are therefore justified in applying the categories. <coughs> Hegel, however, does not ask the Kantian question whether we are justified to apply conceptual structures to appearances. This is because Hegel is not of the opinion that we first have to investigate into our cognit cognitive capacities in order to see if or in which sense categories are suitable for cognition. Hegel thinks that this is the wrong procedure right from the beginning. Thus, Hegel cannot use the term deduce in this Kantian sense of showing the justification of the application of concepts. Now, the first deduction, the metaphysical deduction, has two tasks to show. 
the a priori origin of the categories and their completeness. I have only concentrated on the first task so far, and according to my reading, Hegel has made his point about Kant's failure to the accomplishment of the first task, the task of showing the a priori origin of categories in the first part of the quote. That means I read Hegel as being concerned with Kant's fulfillment of the second task of the metaphysical deduction um, when referring to Fichte. Thus, according to my reading in the second part of the quote, Hegel is not concerned with Kant's claim of the origin of thought determinations, but with Kant's claim to their completeness. Now, according to Kant, we succeed in showing the completeness of the categories when we succeed in showing the systematic connection. Oh, sorry, this was this one. And now quote um, Kant, this division of the categories is systematically generated from a common principle, namely the faculty of judging and has not arisen rhapsodically from a haphazard search for pure concepts of the completeness of which one could never be certain, since one would only infer it through induction, without reflecting that in this way, one could never see why just these and not other concepts should inhabit the pure understanding." End of quote. Just, um, I take the quote to show that Kant thinks, um, yeah, to show that the metaphysical deduction should also um, justify the completeness of the categories, and that they are complete when we found the systematic connection between the categories. And I think that Hegel adopts the term deduce in this Kantian sense. Thus Hegel means by deduce the procedure of showing the systematic connection of concepts, and not of showing the a priori origin or justifying the application to appearances. And note that this fits well to Hegel's remarks into the, in the introduction preceding this part of the encyclopedia. In the introduction, Hegel remarks that a logic needs to be a system in which the, the concept determinations are in, con in a conceptual relation to each other, and he claims that concepts are only justified when their systematic connection is shown. And that's the quote there on the um, slide. A, con um, that's Hegel. a conceptual content has its justification only as a moment of the whole, outside of which it is only an unfounded presupposition or a subjective certainty. End of quote. By deducing categories, Hegel means thus that thinking has to show how the concept determinations are systematically connected, and against the Hegelian background, this means thinking has to uncover the conceptual content, the own pe peculiar content of the concepts. Thus, in the second part, of the penultimate quote, of the long one, I think Hegel is rather concerned with the derivation of the categories in the sense of uncovering their systematic connection than with their origin. To sum up, whereas in Kant, deduce has three meanings, showing the a priori origin of categories, showing their systematic connection, and justifying their application, I argued that According to Hegel, deduce refers to the meaning of showing the systematic connection of the categories, or in Hegel's terms, concept determinations. However, deriving concept determinations in the sense of uncovering their conceptual connections does not necessarily mean, mean that we have to do so in an a priori manner. So I think there's a difference. These are two different points, I would say. And now I turn to the last and third part of my talk, and um, I have 30 minutes, but the Pablo said it's like 40 minutes or 45, just let me know. 45 with the, the <coughs> discussion. Oh, oh really? One hour. One hour. One, one, one hour. hour. Yeah. Ah, so it's one hour. Because it's sorry. plenary, it's not the... Because it's plenary, I'm sorry. Okay. No, don't worry, it's just that you know. I'm sorry, uh, I'm <laughs> okay. new here. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Now I turn, so I turn to the third part of my talk, and I still have a little bit of time, which is great. Um, okay, after having argued for for there being logical room for another reading of Hegel's critique of Kant in the third part of my talk, it remains to be shown why we should not understand the derivation of concept determinations in an a priori manner. Thus, I understand my talk um, as such that I, that I argued in the second part um, that there's logical room for another reading of the comment, of Hegel's comment of Kant's metaphysical deduction. And now um, I want to show that um, that the reading of the derivation of concept determinations 
shouldn't be understood in an a priori manner. <coughs> For this purpose, we call the two implications of the a priori I mentioned in the first part of my talk, the subjective origin and the ahistoricity of a priori concepts and a priori cognition, respectively. I will argue now that Hegel does not subscribe to either of these implications. I focus on the feature of the subjective origin first, again, because I think we can leave this feature aside more easily with respect to Hegel's project. For this purpose, we call that according to Kant, categories arise only in the subject. It is the subject to whom the categories are given and who then tests their applicability. Now, this implies first that the Kantian distinction of a priori and a posteriori is primarily an epistemic distinction. Against the background of this distinction, Kant shows how are we able to gain cognition of the realm of experience and what kind of cognition we are able to gain. In his logic, Hegel, however, does not start with epistemology, but with metaphysics. To call his logic a priori, therefore, seems inappropriate. Second, it is one feature of the strict line Kant draws between the subjective and objective side that categories can never be encountered in intuition. That was the quote I had before in the first part of the talk. Um, Yeah. That, is why the, that is why the transcendental deduction becomes urgent in the first place. So, because Kant said they cannot be encountered in intuition, they are of a priori origin, so we have to um, find a justification for the application of the categories. The need of a transcendental deduction arises because Kant, because Kant draws such a strict opposition between the subjective realm, the capacities of relational subject, and the realm of experience the appearances, things in space and time. With reference to this feature of the Kantian philosophy, Hegel characterizes Kant's approach as that one of an, under this is the quote here, of an understanding that abstracts and therefore separates, that remains fixed in its separations, end of quote. The logic, however, does not have this opposition as its starting point. And one can read the whole phenomenology that shall serve as an introduction into the logic as a project of overcoming the very opposition, and therefore also of overcoming the only subjective origin of categories, or in Hegel's terminology of the concept determination. Now a possible and plausible rejoinder to this would be to concede that Hegel does not buy all the features of the a priori as implicated in Kant. Thus, one could argue that Hegel rejects the claim of the subjective origin of the categories, but one could persist in ascribing a priori status to the logic by claiming that the concept determinations of the logic must be valid independent of experience. Thus, one could persist in ascribing what I have called the feature of an ahistoricity to the concept determinations of the logic. Um, first, I think um, that the textual evidence speaks against such a claim. In my view, Hegel's polemic comments on the a priori in the real philosophy and his claim right at the beginning of the logic according to which the logic considers the sort determinations apart from the abstract form of the a priori do not support such a reading. Second, I think there are systematic reasons for why Hegel does not hold on to the ahistoricity feature either. As announced in the introduction, I will draw on the notion of thinking over, nachdenken, in order to make my case. Hegel uses the concept thinking over terminologically insofar as he claims thinking over to be the defining feature of philosophical activity. That's in the um, encyclopedia in the first part of it, in the introduction part. As at the beginning of the encyclopedia, Hegel states that philosophy can be determined in general terms as thinking consideration of objects. In the same paragraph, Hegel specifies this thinking as a thinking over. It is thinking over that is according to Hegel the principle of philosophy and that has thought determined, has, uh, thoughts and one might add here concepts 
as such as its content. In the last paragraph, I argued that according to Hegel, the derivation of conceptual determinations is about uncovering the peculiar content of concepts. Consequently, thinking over, nachdenken, is the activity we should pursue when we are aiming to gain cognition about the conceptual determinations that structure reality. So the last guiding question now, or well, the guiding question of this last part now is, what does thinking over actually imply, <coughs> and how does thinking over relate to experience? And here, yeah, here I rather make a suggestion, we can discuss then later on. Um, as I have already said, I can't uh, provide a whole theory right now. <coughs> In ordinary everyday language, thinking over implies that it comes after a certain experience. That means you cannot think something over that you have not experienced yet. Assume, for instance, you reacted in a specific situation in a way that does not fit your usual behavior pattern. Like assume you are usually a quiet, rather shy person, but in this one situation you got really angry and shouted at the other person involved in the situation in a way in which your own behavior surprises you. This would be a situation where you, where you would say, I need to think over why I reacted in such and such a way. Along these lines, thinking over relies on certain experiences already made and that we try to understand. I think this is exactly the direction Hegel takes by making thinking over the principle of philosophy. Thinking over is about considering experiences we have made and that we try to understand. Note, however, that spelled out like this, we do not already have a distinguishing feature from the Kantian strategy. Kant could hold the same without giving up the a priori terminology. In contrast to Kant, however, thinking over implies for Hegel that it transforms our sensations, feelings, or notions into concepts or thoughts. And by doing so, thinking over gains insights about that true content. Yeah, yeah, almost done. Sorry. Ah, sorry, I'm lost here. Sorry about that. Okay, now what is important for my argument is that what is transformed by changing a sensation, for instance, into a thought, is according to Hegel, not the content of our former sensation, but the form through which we receive this content. And that's now this quote. Whatever kind it may be, the content that fills our consciousness it's what makes up the determinacy of our feelings, intuitions, images, and representations of our purposes, duties, etc., and of our thoughts and concepts. Hence, feeling, intuition, image, etc., are the forms of this content, the content that remains one and the same, whether it be felt, intuited, represented, or willed, and whether it be only felt or felt, intuited, etc., with an admixture of thought, or whether it is thought quite without any admission. An example might help in illustrating what Hegel actually means by this quote. The appearance of a lightning in the sky is an intuition. As such, it does not yet tell us much about what a lightning actually is. If we want to know, no, if we want to know what really constitutes a phenomenon, we need to think this phenomenon over and investigate into its causes. The, the result of our reflection is no longer a simple sense impression, but a content which we have brought into a conceptual structure. What is specific about philosophy then is that philosophers think the concepts over that we have gained in specific experiences of this kind. That is in our lightning case, they think over the concept of a specific cause with respect to um, our case lightning, they would think over the concept of electricity. And that is what Hegel actually does in his philosophy <coughs> of nature. On a meta level then, philosophers think over this concept of the concept itself. In our case, they think over the concept of a cause itself. And that is also what happens in the logic. Thinking over thus reflects the same content as it is given to an experience just in a different form. Along these lines, Hegel states, it is important that philosophy should be quite clear about the fact that its content is nothing other than the basic import that is originally produced and produces itself in the domain of the living spirit. The content that is made into the world, the outer and inner world of consciousness. In other words, the content of philosophy is actuality. 
The first consciousness of the, this content is called experience. End of quote. Now we are in a position to see why Hegel's approach cannot be an ahistorical one, in the sense I defined earlier in this talk. That is, we are in a position to see why Hegel's approach cannot be one that uncovers conceptual structures that are independent of experience. It is because, according to Hegel, in experience and in philosophy, the content that they are about remains the same. Against the background of my talk, it is clear that this is a direct move against Kant. In Kant, the content of the categories is not the same as the content of experience. That's why we needed a transcendental deduction in the first place. And this is the very reason that Kant allows to claim that there is a priori cognition, cognition that is valid independently of experience. <coughs> oh, okay, and then thank you very much for the attention. Sorry. Thank you very much. You are perfectly in time. So, congratulations. <laughs> And now we can open the floor for the question. The first one is from Felix. Yeah. yeah, ich habe eine Frage zu diesem äh, hegelischen Rekurs auf Fichte in ja. Mann und Sika. Äh, Sie haben zu Recht das äh, Problem der Deduktion angesprochen. Mhm. Nun äh, würde ich da noch einen Zusatz machen. Ja. Und zwar, wenn Sie über Deduktion nachdenken, und das geht auch in Hinsicht auf Kant, da geht es um den Anfang, das haben Sie nicht erwähnt. Meines Erachtens mhm. kritisiert Hegel dort, dass Kant keinen Anfang der Philosophie legitimiert. Und wenn Sie keinen Anfang haben, können Sie nicht reduzieren. Das ist aus meiner Sicht äh, der Hauptschlag, den er dort gegen Kant führt. Und zwar gerade mit dem Denker, der äh, tiefschürfend über den Anfang nachgedacht hat, nämlich Fichte. Mhm. Also ich lese ja. das als eine Attacke auf das Fehlen der Legitimation des Anfangs bei Kant. Mhm. Okay, ja. Deduktion, da stimme ich zu. Danke. Ja. Das, das. Aber das liegt daran, wenn ich einen Anfang habe, dann habe ich eine andere Form von Deduktion als die juristische Legitimation, ja. die Sie gebracht haben. Ne? Ja, ja, ja. Okay, ja, danke. Danke für den Kommentar. Ähm, ich würde das jetzt, ähm, also Sie können mich sonst gleich nochmal korrigieren, weil also ich lese jetzt den, den, verstehe den Kommentar jetzt gar nicht mal in dem Sinne im Widerspruch zu dem, was ich gesagt habe, sondern eher genau als Ergänzung, oder dass der eigentliche Punkt der ist, äh, mit der mit Fichte ja. gemacht wird, der des Anfangs, aber den Punkt könnte ich ja sogar aufnehmen und trotzdem das ja, vertreten, was ich vertrete. Ja, so? Ja. Ja. ja, okay. Nee, ist ein guter Punkt. Ähm, das würde ich einfach übernehmen und äh, mit einbringen. Ähm, ich hatte mich nur auf die ja, anderen Sachen, also auf diese Deduktionsbedeutung ähm, konzentriert, weil Zeitmangel <lacht> und das war der Fokus. Genau. Ja, danke. Ja. Okay. Äh, ja, vielen Dank. Also ich glaube, ich stimme einfach in den groß, größten Zügen einfach überein erstmal, weil ich glaube auch, dass dieser kantische Ansatz einfach verfehlt wäre, also das so zu lesen. Aber was du jetzt so ein bisschen unter den Tisch hast fallen lassen, ist ja sozusagen der Begriff der Notwendigkeit. Mhm. Und sozusagen viele, sozusagen, die dann diesen Begriff des a priori benutzen in Bezug auf Hegel, also ich denke jetzt an irgendwie Hulgate, Marty, Maker und so weiter, die wollen ja eigentlich erstmal auch nur sagen, mit diesem a priori Begriff, dass es sich um notwendige Inhalte handeln muss. Und das kann man eben unterscheiden dann irgendwie von Sachen, die a posteriori gelten, also ähm, Sachen, die halt beliebigerweise gelten. Die Rose könnte rot sein, sie könnte aber auch grün sein und so weiter. Und jetzt äh, würde ich äh, gerne wissen, also würdest du das auch so sehen, dass das sozusagen, wenn man das mit a priori meint, wie es halt viele tun, mhm. dann ist es erstmal unproblematisch und dann die Anschlussfrage wäre, wie bringst du dann sozusagen dieses historische, diese historische Sichtweise ja, im ja, ja. Zusammenhang mit dem Begriff der Notwendigkeit, okay. den Hegel ja wirklich, also ich habe das irgendwann mal gemacht, es gibt glaube ich in den ganzen gesammelten Werken 30 Stellen oder so, begreifendes Erkennen oder begreifendes Denken äh, fällt. Und an fast allen Stellen kommt immer Notwendigkeit. Und dann würde ich jetzt einfach mhm. sagen, scheint sehr wichtig zu sein, ja. dann müsste man klären, was damit gemeint ist, noch ja. wie das mit der Historie zusammen. Danke. Danke. Yeah, that's right. Maybe I answer in English, because okay. I don't know if you all <laughs> understand German. Okay, so he asked about the, um, 
uh, about the concept of necessity, necessity because one would say that a priori is connected with necessity, and that's true. I mean, it's also in Kant's case that a priori and necessity are there's a strong connection between both. Um, so what I so what I argued what well what one cannot do is saying necessity refers to the necessarily apply. This wouldn't be another meaning, you know, because so that would be the reason or the um, task of the <coughs> translated deduction deduction by Kant to show that they necessarily apply to real um, appearances. Uh, so okay. in this sense, it's not necessary. Um, and then one would so the, yeah, I rather have like another question then to you: What is meant with necessary then? And I would say, I mean, it is true that. Hegel also uses the uh, notion of necessity really, really often, um, also in the logic and all this. Um, so, but as I said, I wouldn't say that this means they necessarily apply. I would say what he means by this is, um, or that the, the concept of necessity is connected with um, uncovering the conceptual relations between concepts. That would mean, for example, when we gain knowledge via thinking the concept of inner purposiveness, for example, we understand how this concept of inner purposiveness relates to external purposiveness, to chemism, to mechanism. And in this sense, and these connections are necessary. So yeah, that would be another, yeah, this is my reading of it. And the second, related to this, is the second uh, comment um, on the, um, historical contingency, yes. Um, so the reading I want to pursue um, and I want to elaborate on is rather something saying that in the philosophy of nature and in the philosophy of spirit, Hegel thinks about um, the concepts that he, that, um, but that he really also gained through by, by looking into um, yeah, sure, the yeah. science of his, si um, his time. Yeah. So also by the concept of organism and that Cuvier and all these people um, that Hegel knew. So um, I would say he takes these concepts and the <coughs> philosophy of nature and the philosophy of spirit represents the concepts within a specific historical framework, whereas the logic does not think these con concepts within the um, historical framework, but pure, so to say. Um, and with pure, I mean, it's, for example, you have in the philosophy of nature the um, concept of electricity, that's a specific cause, and um, that's related to some uh, discoveries of the science at his time. But in the logic, then they would think over the um, cause of electricity as cause. So what does it mean to be a cause, for example? And in this sense, the logic does not um, relate to the historical background, but it doesn't mean that the concepts are not somehow um, related to this historical background. <coughs> so that would be like, um, of course, I would have to say and elaborate more on this, but this would be, be the direction I want to go. Okay, but would you say that the concepts in the philosophy of nature doesn't get top-down deduced, but rather you have like, a set of concepts and then you have to like puzzle in some sense and see the connections. Would that like be your answer? The top down did you? Mm. Yeah, like you have the concept of space and then you think about space and then somehow you come to the concept of time and so on. Yeah, well, so what I want to avoid is saying something that here we have the logic yeah. and somehow Hegel sat there at his desk and thought about, like somehow imagined all the um, concept of the logic, mm. and then, wow, it fits really to the philosophy of nature and to, uh, to other you know, discoveries. I don't want to do that. Oh, no, 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 not apply, okay. but like uh, you get the uh, concept of yeah. space. Ich dich ja no? Okay, then. <laughs> no, then we then have nicht genug Zeit. Uh, really short, probably, so you have the concept of space, and then you can apply it to like empirical phenomena. But you get yeah, like but the concept of space, like you get the concept of adverse or bigger. But I just, I really think it's not about application. I really don't think so. Okay. okay. Then we have the question from Sasha in it. Somebody else, no? Okay, no, I will yes, ask. Yeah. Uh, I will ask. I saw you know. first. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, thank, you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It was really a um, um, clear structure on the last Yes, complex. we have 15 minutes. We have still, no, because we're, we're professor of physics, we have 10 minutes more because we started later. Ah. It was. 
<laughs> no, yeah, thank you. It's a very I mean, complex topic, but it was really clearly structured, and yeah, I um, congratulations for that. That's um, I have. I have. What would you say about the idea that uh, Hegel's dismissal of a priori um, brings Hegel to let's have let's say new new concept of a posteriori? Um, I mean, if we take the 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 the, the um, the division, Kant's division yeah. of judgment. So we have synthetic, synthetic a priori, you know, main question, then uh, synthetic a posteriori, the experience, and analytical a priori, which is yeah, definition of analytical. But the empty space, what is not possible for Kant, it's analytical a posteriori. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense. So what would you say about the fact that Hegel is that what what uh, I mean, it's empty space is totally nonsense for Kant actually somehow becomes possible for Hegel so to, to have the analytical a posteriori in the sense in the, in the sense that uh, the deduction yes. comes the name for analytical and uh, what you call historical <coughs> is the name for a posteriori uh, so um, somehow yeah that we have this yeah. uh, kind of analytical a posteriori mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, deduction I mean, and, and, yeah. and the second question would, would you can you elaborate more on the historical objectivity because you know, from your title of yeah, the, yeah, I don't of the yeah like five minutes and two other questions <laughs> okay I just uh, doing the pathway so uh, first response would be that uh, I mean it's interesting to put it in such terms and uh, articulate for an um, posteriori um, but I I don't want like I don't think it's a good idea to think of the logic and derived philosophy uh, in terms of a priori and a posteriori. I really think it's just a distinction that does not fit to, to both. Um, and that, yeah, yeah, okay. And yeah. end of yeah. comment, <laughs> just to yeah. keep it short. We can discuss this later uh, on if you want, but yeah. thanks a lot, yeah. Uh, and second, yes, that's true. Um, I called it historical objectivity because first I thought I could um, elaborate more on the last part, on thinking over and the content related transforming stuff, but then I thought no, I would have to explain first a little bit more um, why I think I'm justified and why there's the motivation to, um, to develop the thinking over account. Um, so the historical objectivity would be, like in the project, the um, a synonym for understanding um, concepts that are necessary um, and with necessary you know necessary connections and that are in the world the structural reality but to understand them situated nevertheless that's what I want to refer with the historical objectivity but it's true that in this talk that's why I pointed um, at the notion just at the beginning to say what I understand by this but it's true that I don't capture um, in this talk everything what is meant with historical object objectivity thanks Okay, perfect. Two questions, less than four minutes. Yeah. So, um, so, based on what you said, do you have this difference of metaphysical deduction, which involves showing a priori origin of the categories and mm -hmm. showing their systematic connection, and then the transcendental one, which is justifying their application. Mm -hmm. So Hegel takes just the second one of the metaphysical, which is showing the systematic connection of yeah. concepts as okay. really meaning the, the, the concept of deduction. Mm -hmm. I would like to know how Hegel um, develops this systematic connection, I mean, based on the fact that the concept is something um, that we form with the experience as well. It's like a confirmation of, of, of a phenomenon, for example, so to speak. Uh, this systematic connection will entail the connection of things that we have um, thought and experienced, uh, but they are, are at all this, uh, at oral, uh, this uh, availability. How can you, can, I, can you explain the systematic connection of concepts? Um, yeah, that's um, that's a good question. I mean, that would be also something. Um, so I understand the question as also elaborating on the last part of the talk because yeah. there is the transformation theory and how do we get to to pure concepts, so to yeah. say, like from lightning to electricity, cause yeah. and then to cause, and then um, yeah, I mean, <coughs> I would say. Um, developing the concepts of concept or conceptual structures that what Hegel does in the logic. So um, I would say that, I mean, there's also some kind of genesis there in the way that we, all, we also only um, think about a cause if we have experienced something like yeah. a cause because then somehow um, 
our capacities are in motion and we come to this kind of concept. Um, but yeah, I think Hegel is really um, of the opinion that we can think the conceptual structures of concepts. And I also think that is, for example, a critique, or it is a critique of Hegel and Kant, another one that the a priori origin, and thinking about the a priori origin, yeah. um, like um, somehow that Kant is so much concerned with this, mm. so yeah. he cannot, because he's so much concerned with this, he is not able to think the content of concepts. That's yeah. another critique of, of Hegel, yeah. Mm. So I would say, yeah, there's this kind of general structure. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> there's this kind of general structure. Um, but at the same time, I think that Hegel is of the opinion that we can't really think content of concepts. Mm. And the content is not only the, the um, appearances. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. The other is starting, so if you can be yeah. super fast. Uh, my, I'm sorry about my English. <laughs> Uh, my question is really simple, it's about the notion of effectivity. I think that when you... Effectivity? Effectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if, if that notion is translated in the same way that in, in Spanish, but it's uh, existing, but in the totality. Thinking about the totality in terms of existing is the effectivity. And then I think, uh, my question is, is that what you are thinking when you say you, you, you refer to the content? When you think you, you I am in, in essentially my question is about the notion of idea and the difference between the notion of idea and the notion of concept. You know? Uh, because I think that is the key to understand really what is the difference between the logic and the philosophy of nature, all the philosophy of spirit. Because the logic itself is and a structure, and a very peculiar structure because it's a structure that has a, a purpose, a purpose, a purpose uh, and the philosophy of nature is it's the, it's the idea. It's the idea, all, uh, it's, it's uh, the concept in its effectivity, but uh, we are seeing that concept from the point of view of the external. Uh, external. We have a lot of time. And uh, the spirit is the same concept that's put in the internal, you know, yes. uh, about the uh, uh, the mobility in, uh, itself, yes. not even in, in, in these uh, steps that you you, you said <coughs> much better than me. Uh, the chemist, then the electricity, then you have the the, the, yes. the, the, the yeah. I mean, it essentially, is what is the role of the notion of idea in, in that in that? Well, yeah, yeah. I, I would say that in the um, okay, the role of the notion of idea. Um, I would say in the logic, I understand the parts of the idea as actually being. Um, so, I would say there is the um, there is the conceptual development just until the idea, and the ideas I think are the most important. Um, as the, mo the most important passages, and I would say in a specific way, all the other concepts of the logic are somehow grounded in the idea. So, in, in the sense that, saying by, for example, the first idea is the idea of life, of life and of opposedness, and then I would also, like James Pines does, for example, say that we can only understand the notion of mechanism or chemism if we have the notion of inner opposedness. Only then can we, you know, think the um, mechanism in an appropriate way, for example. Um, but yeah, I would have to elaborate on this in order to make this more comprehensible, but so in this sense, I would say the ideas are somehow grounding the other concepts, um, because to the, to the extent that um, we only understand all the relations of the other concepts when we think the ideas. Yeah. I hope that's... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you to Karen. Thank you.